Hey, welcome to the dirt. Two business owners for the price of one is kind of the theme today. We uh, we only have one of them joining us today, but we've heard a lot about the solo entrepreneurial journey before. Today, we're going to speak on partnership, talk about building businesses together, including a 400 person software development company that the two of them have started called Dual Boot Partners. We will even take a deep dive into how to grow successful partnerships by growing companies alongside others invested in the same way. The trials, tribulations, and excitement associated in doing so. So, uh, Tabuelo, say hello to everyone. Hey, how's it going? The only thing I would, I'll correct you on is we actually have three. It's me, Ben, and Daniel. So and that'll be a key to the story as we tell it too. Well, per perfect. Two of, two of you were going to be joining initially, but Ben had higher power things to attend to. Yes. So, uh... ben, ben got a last minute invite to the West the Waste Management Open. So he's on, was it hole 16 on the par three uh, cheering, cheering right now. So nice. for those that don't know the, the, the Waste Management Open, it's one of the top golf tournaments in the country. All right. Well, Ben, if you're listening, we'll expect you to come back with at least a few birdies. Yes. Yes. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, so Todd, let's let's go back in time for a moment. Let's talk about how you got your start in this world that we call entrepreneurialism. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, so I quick background. I actually go all the way back to my high school days. And I kind of laugh because I speak at some high schools and I tell them the way I got to entrepreneurship is I wanted to work less hours than all my friends and still go to the to hang out and play baseball, go to the beach, do whatever. So I found this thing called landscaping. And when I grew up, no one had landscapers back then. So I ended up starting a landscaping business with one of my buddies and realized I could work three to five hours a week and make more than my friends that were working 40 hours a week in the summer. So it was kind of enlightened to me on the entrepreneur side. Um, ended up going to Penn State University, ended up graduating from there and ended up getting a job at a software startup in Charlotte, North Carolina, and, and it really accelerated the bug. I got you know, super lucky getting into technology at a really, and this was 1996 at an early stage, kind of when just when Al Gore had found the internet back then and uh, ended up help starting a supply chain software company in 1999 with a few friends. We raised about 35 million, grew super fast, but had a really hard time finding software developers. Towards the end, it was like, can you turn the computer on? Yes, okay, you're our QA department. Hmm. It's still, lo and behold, today in the state of North Carolina where I'm located, there's 33,000 open IT positions. So it's an issue that we still, anyone in the entrepreneur community, especially tech faces around finding developers. Ended up selling to a company in Dallas, Texas. They did development all around the world, which is a blessing to me because I got introduced to some great developers around the world, but it also opened me to the concept of the two types of developers that are out in the world. And I equate it to building a house. You have a house built, when you're done with it, you have your handy person come in or a punch list person come in. 80% of the world's developers are that. They're really good at once the foundation's done, they're really good at coming in, building out that foundation and growing. But what they're not good at is, hey, here's a vision, here's an idea, help me help me create it. And that's where the other 20% of the developer world comes in. So the only challenges for non-technical founders is 100% of developers will always claim they can build your product. So I ended up leaving there, ended up actually starting another outside of tech, a company called Bella Tuna with my wife. We're one of the top leading baby brands in the world. Our claim to fame is for every product we sell, we donate a meal to, the, to a child. We're at over 10 million meals donated. My wife's been named one of the top 100 female entrepreneurs by Inc. Magazine, but I still had the bug to get back into tech. So turning the reins over to her, she's done an amazing job in starting another company called Cloud Logistics with a few friends. It was basically 2.0, the first company we'd set up, except we set it up a little differently. So all customer facing activity we hired here in the US. So I think sales and marketing, CTO, product management, but then we opened a tech center overseas and with the developers that I knew that I could take a product to market. And it was amazing. Never again had an issue finding developers. Was not anti-hiring developers here in the US. We did that as well, but never wanted to feel like I had to overpay for developers or give up too much equity. So over a six year period, I ended up getting up to about four and a half million in revenue. And then about eight years ago, ended up exiting that for about a 10X return to a company called Eda Open in Austin, Texas. 
And when I exited, I ended up getting a number of friends reaching out to me and saying, Todd, I cannot find developers. Can you help me set up teams? So I started doing that. Along that journey, I ended up getting connected with Ben Gilman, who you mentioned earlier. Ben was actually a CTO and a developer, and he was doing a similar model that I was doing, except he would start with a non-technical founder. He would take part equity, part cash in their business, and then build out their teams as the product grew. So Ben and I were doing this. We recognized there was a need potentially to merge together. So we merged together and in comes our third partner, a gentleman named Daniel De La Cruz, who was kind of the, the key to this whole thing. He was our finance and operations whiz. So Ben, myself, and Daniel came together to start Dual Boot about five years ago, actually five years ago this month, which is February when we're recording. Wow. And fast forward now, we're 400 people and growing. We serve startups to Fortune 500 companies, helping them build really creative and innovative technologies. So, so a lot to un- a lot to unpack there. Let, let's yeah, uh, I call that my I call the you know, everyone says you need your elevator speech speech. I call that my escalator speech. So it's a little longer, but I think yeah, it, no, I like it. it. Well, it depends. What, everything. Depends what size building you're in, right? I mean, yeah, exactly. You know, it could exactly. be a hundred. So so let, let let's start with starting a business with your significant other, with your, in this case your wife. Obviously, yeah. a, a success story, but bumps along the way. I can only imagine starting a business with my wife. <laughs> Yes. So any anything that, that you learn, any big lessons, trials, tribulations, whatever you want to call them, that other folks who might be starting a business or be in the middle of a business with their significant other can learn from? Yeah, absolutely. So it's, it kind of goes to that song, Opposites Attract. Yep. So like with my wife and I in our business, like we have completely different personalities. So I'm more extrovert. She's more introvert. And I think that was the best lesson I learned is we never really overlapped on things. I'll tell you though, as we started to grow, what became inherently clear to me is someone had to take a leadership role because some employees would get, would have challenges coming to each one of us and be like, do I go to to Todd or Michelle? And I ended up like, Michelle was a lot smarter than me, was a lot better running the business. So I ended up kind of sitting in the back and letting her run it. But that was very difficult swallowing your pride in many cases. Again, I'm an extrovert, so I want the room in some cases, but I recognized she was the better leader for that company. So I swallowed my pride. What it allowed us to do though, both having flexibility, we have two daughters, it allowed us to really focus on our daughters. So I could go pick her, pick up my daughter up at school, my, other, my wife could do that. So that was the beauty of both being kind of in this entrepreneur world in that situation. The other thing I tell people, when we got married, we made a commitment that we were always going to live on one salary. Even though both of us were working, we always lived on one salary so that if something happened, whether, hey, we want to start a business. In our case, it was a tragedy. Her brother ended up passing away from a drug and alcohol addiction. But by her, by her quitting and resetting life at that point, it didn't take us. We didn't have to. We didn't have to work. We didn't have to both work. One of us had to work, but both of us didn't have to work. So. I try to tell as many people like that are, you know, get married and they're like, oh, we're going to build this big house or buy this car. I was like, make sure you live on one income because you never know what's going to happen. And because we made that decision, it has allowed us to continue to build companies and grow companies. And one of us be without a salary for a time being without really impacting our lifestyle. Yeah, that's that's great. And when you take some of those same lessons and apply them to your other partnerships, right, Ben, Daniel, what what are some of the qualities that you think make a successful business partnership? Yeah. So in the case of Ben Daniel and myself, we are again, three different segments. So I run business development, Ben runs technology, Daniel runs finance and operations. I think that's why we work so well. We don't, we know our paths. We know what we're in charge of. We hold each other accountable. We use something called the Entrepreneur Operating System. There's a book called Traction by Gino Wickman, and it really gets us on the same page for that quarter. And like I said, we don't typically cross over. The nice thing about having people is that when there's a disagreement between two of them, a third party can come in that's kind of independent and settle down and calm down the masses. I've been involved with situations where there's a solo owner. I would never want to be a solo owner in something. So you look at Bella Tuna and you say, well, Michelle is the owner of Bella Tuna. She really, it's Michelle and I. So like when she was down, I could pick her up. And that's the plight of, a, of an entrepreneur is like Monday, you could be the, have the greatest day of your life. And then Friday, you're wondering if you're going to make payroll. Right. And you need that cheerleader in your camp 
along that journey. And that's why I think the partnerships are key in, when you're building companies. And I used to, there was a lot of VCs that were like, we will never invest in a single owner. I kind of see it now. I still will invest in a single owner, but I see why it's important to have a partner or, or maybe multiple owners just to kind of give people pep talks when they need to bring them down off for a ladder and things like that. So I think the partnership is key, but also I think it's partnering with people that have, that are not like you and have right. complementary skill sets. So on, on that note of complementary skill sets, you know, complementary mindsets, complementary, you know, whatever we want to look at it as skill mindset, all these things combined, what, how do you ensure at the end of the day that you're on the same page about making decisions? Yeah, I think we, again, the, I, I don't want to pound this much, but the entrepreneur operating system has something called the vision track, traction organizer. Mm -hmm. And basically what it says, and this is what we did at day one at dual boot. We said, where do we want to be in five years? So it's real high level. You might say, I want to be this much revenue, this much profitability. Okay. What does that look like? Then you boil it down to where do we want to be in one year, in the next year, and what are the 10 things we need to do? And then you boil it down to the next 90 days. What are the 10 things we need to do in the next 90 days? And then what are any blockers getting us to those to achieve those milestones? We get together, Daniel, Ben, and I, and this is from day one, we get together every 90 days and put together this map and then review it. So it holds us all accountable. There's no like, hey, you didn't do this, you didn't do that. And, you know, there's these 10 things, we each have our name next to it. And we say, hey, Todd, why didn't you get this done? Or, hey, Ben, why didn't you get this done? And it, it, it's the ultimate in accountability and measurability that I think is key as you're growing and scaling businesses. Because too often as an entrepreneur, every day you have a new idea. But if you can say, I know I have a new idea every day, but here are the 10 things I'm going to get done in the, in the next 90 days. At the end of 90 days, you can look at those 10 things and be like, all right, I know I'm making progress as I got these done. I know I've got 10 other things that, I, that I've been doing, but I got the 10 things done that we all agree. When you, when you disagree on things, how are you able to handle disagreements between the three of you guys? Trust, because I've worked with these gentlemen for a while. I know they, I may not agree with some of their perspectives, but I know they have the best for our families and the trust of the company. Mm -hmm. I, I, honestly, I think that's what it comes down to. The minute you lack trust in someone or something, you see a deterioration of, of the relationship. And I think that's, as I've gotten older, I've, I've learned that, that trust is one of the most important things. I know people talk about it all the time. I also, as I've gotten older, I used to get worked up if someone did something that I you know, didn't quite think was the right way. But as I've gotten older, I, I start thinking, does it really matter? So I kind of look at things when people are coming at like, you know, and, and my wife uses this example a lot. It's like, you've got rubber balls and glass balls, you know, which ones are you, you only have, you can only have two in your hands. Which ones are you going to keep? You're going to keep the glass ones so they don't crash and break. So you know, the rubber ball is letting them bounce. So if I'm disagreeing with someone about something, I kind of try to play that in my mind. Like, does this really matter? Is this really impacting the growth of our company or am I just being stubborn? And if it's something I'm being stubborn, like, all right, let's let it play out. So we, I'll give you an example. The first couple months of our company at Dual Boot, we wanted to try, well, I did not want to try, but we wanted to try a billboard on the highway to see, will people actually buy from Dual Boot with a We Build Great Software billboard on I-77, which is here in Charlotte? I didn't think it would work, but you know what? I wasn't worth, it wasn't worth fighting. So we ended up trying it. It didn't work, but you know what? Everyone was happy. We tried it. We moved on. No one, you know, we didn't lose, we lost maybe, you know, $3,000 worth of expenses, which was not going to cripple our company, but we tried it and we try to do everything in 90 days. So that if we fail, we fail very fast. That's the other thing as an entrepreneur, if you don't fail fast, it can be the detriment of your company. Yeah. Failing fast. So I hearing trends, trust, failing fast, right? Leveraging an operating system, whether that's EOS, like you guys leverage or, or some other operating system, but a model to drive success. And let's talk a little bit about the evolution, right? How has, you guys have been doing this for five years, the three of you, you and your wife a lot longer than that. How has the partnership or relationship needed to evolve over time? I think for the three of us at Dual Boot, we're all in different life stages. So I've got daughters that are going to college. Hmm. Uh, ben has sons that are 
kind of going into to middle school, a little, they, he has younger ones and Daniel just had his, his first baby. So I think priorities around family are different. And that's what I've noticed. You know, I think not everyone is meant to have a family. I understand that. But when you have a family, you start realizing why people weren't around from five to seven, you know, like I'm working hard. Well, they weren't there because they were at their kids games, which is more important okay. to me, like be there, be a present dad. So some of those things, you know, you just learn over time that I think Daniel and Ben have started to realize like, Hey, why isn't Todd here at five o'clock or six o'clock? Cause now they're fathers and, and now they see it on that side. Mm -hmm. But I, like I said, I think the key for us is constantly measuring and defining what we want to get done. If you have three people that aren't doing that, it can be very frustrating, especially in kind of the environment that you run in. Most entrepreneurs right now, it's there, you know, we're coming off COVID. It's been a remote environment. And when things aren't going well, the quickest thing to, to start pointing at other entrepreneurs is like, well, I don't think you're doing enough. Or why aren't you online now? So if you say, well, here are the 10 things we wanted to do at the beginning, we've done it. Then everyone's like, yeah, all right, you've done it. You're right. I, I need to step back. Like, I know we're all trying this. Right. You know, things aren't working out right now. Right. So on that note, I mean, there's a lot of things we've talked about that probably connect to this, but long-term success is kind of this common trend around everything you're bringing up and, and ensuring the business partnership is set up for the long-term. Are there any other things that other entrepreneurs, other business owners can learn from as it relates to setting things up in a partnership for the long-term? Yeah, I think, you know, there's, from, I mean, definitely get a, it's worth paying for good legal advice at the beginning. And, yes, and I have been that. guilty of trying to find the, you know, hundred dollar lawyer. Also, I think get advice from people that have been through it before. The challenge as an entrepreneur is often when you go, when you're early stage, you're going to a lot of these events. These events mm -hmm. can be good, but many times the people at the events are trying to sell you something and they haven't been through it before. So you need to try to find the entrepreneurs that aren't at the events. Because typically the ones that have scaled are focusing on their business and aren't don't have enough time to go to many of those events. On the the other thing I've learned over time is like people's advice is their advice. It doesn't mean it's you just need to take that into consideration. I had someone tell us, someone in the Charlotte community that is very very well respected, tell me that there's no way our company would ever work. And here we are five years later. We're the last two years we've been the top ten fastest growing private companies. In Charlotte, we were up for a finalist for Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year. So people's advice is their advice. Don't let that distract you. The other thing I will tell, you know, as you're growing and things like that is um, try to get someone that's an independent party giving you advice. So your friends and family are always going to tell you what you want to hear. Sometimes you need to hear from someone else so that they can give you true advice. I've been in many situations where someone has a really big business bad business plan or business idea. Their family though was like, that's a great idea because their family wants to be an entrepreneur or know an entrepreneur, right? So they're cheer yeah. they're your cheerleader. So you sometimes get a voice of reason beyond that. And I think as we've matured as a company, the one thing we've done really well is get advice of people that have been there and done that to kind of pour back into us. And that's one of the things we try to do now in our community, in our company. And, and when we started out, we all try to be servant leaders. And what my definition of a servant leader is someone that walks into a room and says, how can I help you? Not how can I sell you? Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people have helped us along the journey. And now we try to pay it back to people that are just getting started in, in, in their journey. I love that. When you narrow it down to the most rewarding aspect of having partners that are in in it with you, in the dirt with you, if you will. All right. What, uh, what is that most rewarding aspect and how can other maybe solo founders that are thinking about partnership or, or just in any, in really anyone in general that's thinking about partnership, what can they look at as kind of the, the most rewarding aspect? I mean, the truth is your companies, if you happen to kind of hit on a really fast growing companies, you are going to see a lot of success, success financially in other areas. And the challenge is you really can't brag around that. And I say brag, you can't really celebrate that except around your family, maybe your, maybe your wife or your significant other, and then your business partners that know everything going, going around. Now you can do the, the ceremony like, Hey, this is our five year, here's our birthday cake for the company. Yeah. But there's some personal things that are happening 
to an entrepreneur that you just can't share with others. I mean, some people may want to, but there's just some personal things you don't want to. And having that group that you, the confidence that you can trust and celebrate with. And like I said, every 90 days when we do our, our vision traction organizer, we actually go usually to some cool spot. And it's almost like a small celebration the three of us have together. This is really cool what we're building. Let's take a day out of our, our lives and just really understand what we're doing and appreciate what's happening right now. Cause it is not normal, you know, nine out of 10 startups fail and we happen to be on the other side right now. Now next year it might be the opposite, but you need to enjoy the moments as they're happening. Yeah. That's so key. So take, take me back to when you guys were, let's say 20, 30, 40, 50 people, you take a pick a few million in revenue, right? And what were some of the, biggest challenges that you were facing then that you've overcome as you've developed and grown the business? Um, I think, well, when in the beginning, it was just, you know, we were four or five people and we had to get someone to trust in us that to put their life's life's dream of building their technology. So Mm -hmm. just building that trust was, was one of the harder because we're a global company culturally aligning in different respects. And I, I think people overlook that too often. So for example, here in the US, it's not uncommon for you to grow up, to leave, to move to another part of the to the country. Many of us are striving to make more and more money. A lot of the places we have offices, it's not like that. They grew up there, their grandparents are there, their aunt and uncles are there. Their family, I'm not saying that our families aren't important, but their family and living next to their family is more important than the job they do. Mm-hmm. So it's culturally figuring out how to interact with the different cultures of the different company, the different countries we're working in. That was very difficult. Eastern Europe, you tell them one thing, they do it, but they never tell you they did it. In the United States, you tell us, sometimes we'll do it, but we're going to make sure and brag about it when we do it, right? So it's just that, like we've had, we had situations where we delivered excellent code and the client said, well, you never told me. And our developers are like, well, why do we have to tell you we delivered actually that's you told us that was the case. And so it's building that cultural knowledge of the different places that we're working in and, and how does that effectively work and deploy in the US. That's a great point. The uh, you guys have obviously experienced tremendous scale that few companies are able to do in such a short time, right? Especially services businesses. 400 people in five years. Scaling the business is is something that obviously every everyone thinks about as a business owner, but sometimes people scale way too soon. Sometimes people will scale one part of the business without thinking about the rest. What, what challenges or how did you address, I guess, the challenges of scaling your business? I mean, it was sometimes it was trial and error. I give a lot of credit to my other business partner, Daniel De La Cruz, because that was his expertise before coming in. He worked at PwC and really in the risk and, and scaling side of it. And he really put a lot of processes in place to allow us to scale. But I'll give you a good example of what's happening to me right now. So I run business development at Dual Boot. In a services company, it's almost like a grow and a grow or die mentality. So if you're not constantly selling, and a client cuts you off, that could be, you know, you're laying off a quarter of your workforce or whatever it may be. So we had to go and hire business development people to, you know, to sell beyond just me. So over the last two years, I've really been focusing on building a great business development team. We have about 14 people on our team right now. But what ended up happening is my greatest skill set is my network. I always tell people my network is your network is your net worth. And in my case, that's really the truth. Like my network is the, that's what I bring to dual boot is my network. But by having to focus on the business development and growing that I went from selling 80 deals a year to 40 deals a year. Right. And so what I quickly realized, well, it took me a little, about a year and a half, two years, I'm not the one that should be building the business development team. I'm the one that should be out there networking, getting us relationships. I need to go hire people, a person or people to help me grow this. Mm-hmm. And those are lessons le- like I didn't think about that when it was going to process like, oh, we'll just add new business development people. Yeah, you add new business development people, but then you got to meet with them every week. You got to ask them on their scorecards. Are they doing this? So that, you know, with 14 people, that ends up being, you know, two days of meetings that I have where I'm not growing the business. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and so that was a big lesson learned from me of, of figure out what your, your, how, why you've been successful and then hire around the areas of weakness that you may have. Unfortunately, in society today, and especially in business development, it's like we want to be leaders. A leader doesn't mean you have 15 people under you. You can be a leader and not do that. And in my case, I, I've hired someone now that does sales ops. She's amazing. But I can still lead by example. But society wants to say, well, how many people would like to, to, how many people do you report to you? Well, does it really matter? You know, does that really matter? And so breaking those norms are very hard, especially with a lot of entrepreneurs are ego driven. You know, and it's a, the classic case now of asking a kid where they went to college. Hmm. In tech, you really don't need to go to college. You, I, I mean, I hate to say that. Some kids do. Some kids, 15 years old are whiz bangs at technology. Like they can create instrumental. So college isn't necessarily the, the path they need to go. If you're in a plumber or like, it's not, but that's our, fir- that's our first question that we ask people, where'd you go to college? And people get embarrassed by that. We got to break those stigmas or those mind frames around that. And that's, you know, I'm kind of going on a rant right now, but like, yeah, it's a good I'm rant. passionate about that now because yeah. I got caught in the, well, I needed to go to college. I needed to join a fraternity. I needed to be an athlete. I needed like, no, you don't. <laughs> you don't. Yeah, we get caught up in this in this whirlwind of expectation and kind of miss the point sometimes. <laughs> yes, right? exactly. Uh, yep. it's, it's all about purpose. And yep. whether that purpose involves an education or a heavy academic career is kind of up to the inv- individual. So yep. I, I, I love the rant. Um, well, and, and during COVID, I actually, there's a, a, I guess it's a life coach, business coach. It's a, it's a woman named Donna McLean that I worked with. And she really helped me define my purpose because I was struggling for a bit of like, what is my purpose in life? And she says, she said, she, she gives you a symbol and she gave me the symbol of a hand. Todd, you're a hand that helps someone get from A to B. I'm like, that makes sense because I'm always connecting. I'm always connecting people. But then mm-hmm. I said, I want to take that a, a step further. Like the people I enjoy helping are the people that I feel like can't get to the starting line. I like helping people get to the starting line. I don't like the person that's been built, you know, born into wealth or whatever. They can already run the race. I like helping people get started to run the race. So it was like that clarity for me was game changing. People always talk, what's your purpose in life? Like that is my purpose in life. And I ended up investing in Donna to do this life coaching Again, when I was younger, I was too cheap to pay for Donna. I should have paid for, I wish I would have done that when I was 25. But then I was yeah. too cheap because, you know, I'm always doing startups. And I really wish I would have invested in, in her, you know, or whoever at that time to give me feedback on that stuff. Yeah, I wish I had hired an executive coach way earlier than I did, which was two years ago or so. But, but at the same time, you know, was my was my past self ready for the same level of coaching that I received? I don't, I, I don't know. <laughs> no, you're, you're absolutely right. And on uh, truth be told, a lot of the executive coaches I knew, and this is not the case for all of them I know now, but they were like failed business people that were trying to figure out what the heck they were going to do next in their lives. So like right. I had this, this not so healthy view of an executive coach. Well, yeah, I mean, that's kind of the same, the same mantra around consulting in a lot of ways, right? It's like yeah. there's everyone wants to be a consultant or a coach and then you dial into their history and have they actually done what they're coaching or consulting about? It's yeah, it's kind of silly, but but I do feel like that kind of weeding itself out on both fronts, which is good. You know, the one of the things I've found most fascinating about what you guys have built is that you've built it in a relatively a, a built a very fast growing company in a relatively um, I won't say small market, but it's, it, you know, you're not building this in New York City, right? And and in a crowded marketplace, meaning there's a lot of competitors out there. How do how do other entrepreneurs who are building in a little bit smaller of a market, right, mid level market, and in a very crowded space, how you know how do they how do they win? Like you've been able to win. Yeah. So I mean, for us, what was always interesting is when we started Dual Boot in the state of North Carolina, there were 21,000 open IT positions. So yes, wow. there's a lot of people knocking your door saying they can service, but there's clearly something wrong with the model if there's still 21,000 open IT positions. And then back then, if you look, there was like the, the universities were producing something like a thousand new people a year. And so the problem was only getting, it was only magnifying. So we recognize that gap. The second is I knew that industry, I've been doing in this industry for 20 to 25 years. Um, 
And what I knew about that industry is if you remember, I was telling you a story of developers and there's two types of de developers. There's kind of the, the punch list developer, which is 80% of the market with once the house is built, those are the people you should be using. And then the 20% that are visionary. What I realized is a lot of people hadn't figured that out. So they would go use a team somewhere else, India, China, wherever, but they were trying to use them at the wrong time. And they had really, really bad experiences. And so yeah. I knew there was, there was uh, 21,000, or we knew there was 21,000 openings. We knew people were having bad experiences and we knew we had a really good team of developers that actually could give them good experiences. The other thing is if you think about most services or engineering or companies, they're started by engineers. We were business first that happened to become engineers. Mm -hmm. And so that little slight mind frame, like that's, we, we focused a lot on content, getting content out there before anyone did. If you follow us on LinkedIn, we're pretty much everywhere on LinkedIn. And that was a lesson I learned really early on at one of my first startups. We probably, we did raise 35 million. We probably spent 34.9 million on the product. And when we ended up selling it, I saw our competitor products. I'm like, how did we ever lose? And the reason we, le we lost is no one knew about us. So I said, I am never going to make that mistake. If I have a good product or, or services, I am going to make sure everyone knows about us. So we heavily involved and got connected into kind of content marketing, marketing in general. And over that, and you, you probably, I think you see that with the businesses that you're probably involved with around that is they have a great product. No one knows about them, but they're so prideful in their product. They think everyone should know about them. Right. And their customers love them. So why wouldn't their customers just natively be telling everyone about them? Right. Exactly. That, that, yeah, exactly. That's what they're using as business development. And, that, and that's the engineering mentality, right? I built something right. good. Why isn't everyone coming to, you to look at it? Right. Exactly. Exactly. Well, you hit on something on the innovation and visionary side of software development. You know, one question that as a visionary yourself that I'm just curious about, what do you see as the future of software development? Like what is the future? What do you think the future of software development looks like? You know, the I, I hate to say it, but the scary thing is it changes. So like I'll give you a great example right now, of chat GPT, like yeah. what it, it launched in November and I, I had a meeting the other day with one of my friends that writes, he writes for TV stories and things like that, TV series. And he said, Todd, my industry is going to be gone. He's mm -hmm. like, I wrote six bullet points about, you know, a unicorn that played in an opera that blah, 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 blah. And he's like, and I hit, I hit in 30 seconds left. It had a really good script. And that, that's what is scary about a lot of this stuff is like, I can go and predict where we're going to be. Right but you just don't know. So you have to, you have to be constantly educating yourself, but ready for disruption. And I think that's the thing in the tech space is you have to be constantly thinking, what is going to disrupt me? The minute you get complacent, you get, so I'm not like, you know, I'm not one of those sage things of where are we going with technology? Like I'm just constantly learning, you know, blockchain, crypto, AI, all this stuff. Like at the end of the day, a lot of it's buzzwords too. So uh, you gotta, <laughs> yeah. you know, you got to be careful on that stuff. But, right. uh, it's it's like a, you're, you add AI or you add blockchain to your company description. And all of a sudden, you you know, if you're a publicly traded company, you go up 30, 40 oh, percent overnight. Right. I, you know, I'll give you a good example. I got in, you know, I stayed away from buying crypto forever. And I was like, all right, I'm just going to do some of this for fun. And I ended up using an app called Voyager. And the use, reason I use Voyager is there was a gentleman named Mark Cuban, who everyone knows. And you can go look this up on Twitter now who got up and said, you should use Voyager. It's one of the safest places that you can put your money in. I, I could have used Coinbase or whatever. So I put in Voyager. I didn't do any due, due diligence. I just kind of believed him, which was stupid on my part. Well, Voyager now went bankrupt and now I've got all my money stuck in there that I can't get out right now. Maybe I'll get part of it. So, but anyways, yeah. I've, I've, I've learned a lot of life lessons through stupidity, many, many cases, stupidity. Yeah, but that's the cool it. thing about like the age I'm in. So I'm 48. So 1999, we had the tech boom and bust. So that, you know, you could, at that time, you could put any money in the stock market and it would be up 200% the next week. And then all of a sudden that material, that vaporized. You had 2007, 08, you had the whole real estate boom bust. So I was involved in that. You had all, right now we, we had all the crypto, whether that's a boom or bust is yet to be seen, but you know, you see it. Companies like Celsius and others are, you know, not, you know, 
have not been good. We had COVID. We have seen a lot in a very short time period that's really allowed us to educate ourselves. And hopefully you learn from those mistakes from the past. Yeah. And luckily for me, I made the mistakes when I was younger and didn't have any money. So it didn't really hurt me that bad. It would yeah. suck if I was you know, 65 years old and hadn't learned that. And I lost you know, three quarters of my income in real estate. All right. All right. This has been so much fun today. So before we close off here, I got what we call the founder five to close off the show, the, the five quick hit questions of things that are driving your growth and value in the market. So first one is number one metric or KPI that you are relentlessly focused on. For me, because I'm on BizDev, you, you meet 10 to 15 people a week. I don't care who they are, meet 10 to 15 people a week. If you talk to 10 to 15 people a week, you will be successful in what we do. Love it. All right. Top tip for growth stage founders like yourself. The vision track and organizer. I don't care what it is, but do something where you're measuring where do you want to be in five years? Where do you want to be in a year? And what do you have to do in the next 90 days and get your team to buy into that? Yeah. A favorite book or podcast that's helped you to grow as a founder? Atomic Habits is a great mm -hmm. book. If you haven't read that podcast, I mean, I listen to a lot. I'm listening to three men in a three, always old man in a three right now with JJ Reddick, which is pretty good. But Oh, um, is that? I haven't, I haven't yeah, listened to that. Yeah, but the one I really like is there's a leadership podcast by Craig Groeschel. Uh, hmm. Don't let it, you know, if you're religious or not, he's, he is a, he's a pastor, but his leadership podcast is much more than that. And it's excellent. It's excellent. And then Guy Raz to how I built this is always a, you know, classic fan yeah. favorite on that one. Yeah. And um, a shout out right. to my friend, Colin Odegaard. She's got a good, a good kind of life help, like a 15 to 20 minute podcast I listen to too. And what, what's hers called? Uh, wake up to your life. Okay. All right. There we go. We got a little spotlight. Okay. What actor would play you in a movie? Well, it's not an actor, but Prince Harry. People say I look like Prince Harry so. like or it. Dale Jr. When I was skinnier, I was Dale Jr. a lot. So. I can see that. Too. Dale Earnhardt Jr. I don't know if we have NASCAR fans. Some NASCAR fans may not do that. Royalty Prince Harry, NASCAR. Royalty NASCAR. I like I'll, I'll send you a picture of Prince Harry in his flight when he was flying a plane that looks eerily like me. Cool, cool. All right, last one. What is going to be the title of your autobiography when you're all said and done? Oh, man. I guess the hand, <laughs> the helping hand. I like it. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> the helping hand, that in quotations, helping in and hand, yeah. just just a visual. Yes. I mean, I, like I, I, I. So one last thing I'll kind of leave you with is what I've told my team. I hate happy hours. Like I am anti happy hours. Not because I I drink, so like that, that's not because. But I feel like the hours between five and eight, you should be with your family or taking care of yourself, whatever that means, fitness wise, whatever it is. So I am on a mission to try to get people to do different events outside of happy hours. So one of the things that we've done here at, at Dual Boot is we actually go serve at something called the Charlotte Rescue Mission, which is 120 day res residential treatment for those that struggle with drugs and alcohol. We go take 30 people down from 10.30 to noon and there are 30 cultivated people. So it's prospects, it's customers, it's influencers, and they go serve a meal to the men and women in their program. And then right next door is something called Community Matters Cafe, where the people that are graduating from the program can actually go work to get experience because many of them have done bad things through their substance abuse and they can't get employed right away. So it gives them an ability to show something on their resume and gives them job training. Yeah, That is the best happy hour ever. One, it's during hours of work. Two, it's giving back. And three, the networks that you can, that you create through giving back have been unbelievable. And it avoids the whole five to eight when I think you should be with your family. Now I'm losing that battle because everyone wants to have their happy hours and stuff between five and eight, but I am trying my darndest to get people to reimagine when they need to be networking. Yeah, no, I like that a lot. That's that's terrific. All right, well, so I'll, I'll challenge you, Jim, to do something like that in the future. No, I, I I was just thinking about how do I how do I work with Brock on your end to start doing some something like that here in Tampa. Yeah, Brock, if you're listening, yeah. we gotta we gotta figure that out, buddy. All right. So you've given a ton to our listeners today. So just time for a little bit of self-promotion. How, how can those listening help you out on your journey? Yeah. I mean, if they have someone that needs to build technology or building technology and, and either need help and guidance of it or struggling with their current scale or growth, we'd be happy to help them out. 
if I can personally, if you, you can find me on LinkedIn, but if there's something you have a question on growing and building businesses, I'm happy to, to jump on a quick call and give you my advice for what it is. But again, you, you, you need to formulate your own opinions of many things. Cause like I said, I, you know, I still remember this day six years ago where someone told me, why are you doing this business? It'll never work. So a lot of, a lot of negative. You get, out there. Yes. Yes. Yeah. But, but listen, listen to your inputs, but create your own output. I like that. I like that. I'm going to steal that. Yeah. It's yours, man. It's yours. It was basically yours anyway. I just switched up the word. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Todd, how can listeners get in touch with you if they, uh, if they do want to reach out? Yeah, just on LinkedIn, Todd Bulo. You can find me there. Email todd.bulo at dualbootpartners.com. I'll leave you on this point too. You need to find the best way to communicate with people. Um, some people email, some people like phone calls, some people like text. I didn't realize this until our company started growing. To give you an example, I get a thousand emails a day. Same. And I think a lot of people are like, well, I emailed that person. Why don't they get back to me? It's probably because, you know, Maybe they checked the email at you know eight o'clock at night and then forgot. So it's not bad to follow up with people. And I think in today's society, too many people feel guilty of following up, but that's actually can be your secret tool is following up. Right. Be your differentiator. I love it. Yeah. I forget what it is, like the average number of touch points required, but it's definitely oh, double. I, I had a I had a guy in because we have a CRM. I reach out to him every month. And said, "Hey, are you still interested in this project? Are you still doing it?" He ended up signing the contract with us. And you know what he told me? The reason I signed the contract, Todd, with you was because you were the one that that kept responding and repeating, and everyone just fell off. So I knew I could trust you. I was like, yep. "All right." Sometimes that's, <laughs> if all that's it takes. what it takes. <laughs> yeah, sometimes that's all it takes. Awesome, man! Thanks for joining, Todd. It's been a pleasure. Yep, Jim. Thank you very much.